Hello, good evening, and uh, welcome back to session number four of JCN Live. Uh, to this session is using best practice to manage chronic edema, and it's in partnership with Essity. So thank you very much for uh, your support, Essity. This evening's presenter is Rebecca Elwell. Uh, Rebecca is uh, joining us again. She's done uh, some of these events with us in the past, and Rebecca is a Macmillan Lymphedema Advanced Nurse Practitioner and team leader and BLS trustee. Uh, Rebecca, how are you? Very well, thank you, are you? I'm very good, I can see, like me, you're, you, you're, you've got a bit of festivities going on in the background there. Not quite as much as you, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, looking very good anyway. Um, so just uh, as I said earlier, and as, uh, as, as you can see, we're, we're live from our home, so if, you've got any, if we get any technical issues, then uh, do pl please bear with us. Um, ask as many questions as you can, because after the presentation, I'll be back uh, to have a discussion with Rebecca and do the, uh, the live Q&A. Um, certificates, as always, will be available via a link at the end. Uh, just again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate um, the, uh, the support, as always. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Rebecca. Rebecca, I'll see you after the presentation. Good luck, and um, I'll catch up with you shortly. Thanks, Alec. That's great. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I hope you enjoyed the uh, session uh, from Comfortech and with Joy. Um, so today we're talking about um, managing best practice in chronic edema. Um, I work at the Royal Stoke University Hospital um, and um, we're in tier three. So I have sympathies with any of you that are not enjoying your Christmas shopping um, or Christmas meals, as we were talking about before. And I'd like to thank the JCN and Essity for inviting me um, to deliver this session this evening. So um, the learning objectives um, for tonight's session is to highlight um, the underestimated number of people with chronic edema hidden within your workload to understand why and how chronic edema develops, to understand how best practice can ensure our patient group um, are assessed appropriately um, and treated in a timely fashion, to understand when and where compression should be applied, um, as below knee is not always enough, and to understand um, garment selection um, and measurement. So this is what the chronic edema best practice statement looks like. Um, and this is available on the SRT and the British Lymphology Society websites. And the aim of the document is to provide an evidence base to underpin the management of chronic edema in the community to improve patient outcomes and experience. And chronic edema is a broad term that we use to describe swelling that's been present for three months or more and that does not respond to diuretic um, therapy. And commonly it um, affects the limbs. And in this presentation, we're going to focus on the lower limbs. Um, but if a patient has swelling affecting the body, the head, the neck, um, the chest, uh, the genitals or the arms, they really should have access to a lymphedema service where possible. So lymphedema is a type of chronic edema um, and those sites of swelling um, really do require specialist input. We are aware, however, that the importance of a document like this is because not all areas have a lymphedema service. So it's an ever increasing problem in the UK um, or how to manage chronic edema because we know it's increasing year on year. It's progressive and debilitating um, and requires lifelong management. Um, and we know that the numbers are greater than other long term conditions such as um, CVA or stroke. So the number of people who are getting older in our population um, with polymorbidity and obesity um, is increasing and therefore we will continue to see chronic edema um, in ever increasing numbers um, as we proceed. In 2012, um, a study showed uh, within a general population of the UK that 3.99 people in every thousand have chronic edema. And that's three times the previously reported rate of 1.33 per thousand. And it's thought that this correlates directly with associated polymorbidity and age. So in the over 85s, the prevalence of chronic edema increases to 12 people in every thousand. And by 2039, it's estimated that 3.5 million over 85s will be experiencing and living with chronic edema. The prevalence of chronic edema has 
a significant association with the presence of a wound. So Moffitt et al. study in 2019 reported between 52 and 69% um, of patients cared for um, by community nurses had chronic edema, and of these, 73% also had a leg ulcer. So quick revision of the anatomy and physiology of the vascular and lymphatic system. So this is an overview of your vascular system. So blood is pumped around the body by your heart, along the arteries, into the arterioles at the capillary network, where an exchange occurs with the uh, fluid being forced out into the tissues to bathe them with oxygen and nutrients. And then there is a process of return of deoxygenated blood by the tiny venules and then into the larger veins. It's a one way system with valves to control backflow. The lymphatic system um, is a blind ended system. So there are finger like projections um, that are directly under the surface of the skin. You can see that depicted with the um, initial lymphatic here, um, a finger like projection that's made up of endothelial cells which are attached by anchoring filaments to the surrounding structures. So when you move those endothelial cells can open and absorb fluid. There are valves uh, much smaller than uh, in the vascular system and there is a reliance upon movement. There's no pump um, like the blood circulatory system with the heart. So it relies wholly on movement to propulse fluid um, along the initial lymphatics into the deeper channels. And eventually those lymphatic channels will reach a lymph node or filter station where fluid will be filtered. So it resembles a river flowing from the source through streams and tributaries and out to sea. It's closely intertwined with the circulatory system. So any fluid that's absorbed from the tissues by the lymphatic system will be returned in time to the blood circulatory system. And it has three main functions. One is to transport fluid. The second one is to absorb fat from the gut. And the third one is to um, fight uh, infection. So it has a, uh, a defense mechanism. And that's why there is a very close correlation between chronic edema and cellulitis. So what are the causes of chronic edema? There's um, a lack of movement or immobility. We said the lymphatic system was reliant upon movement. So dependency um, is a key cause. Any end stage failure, system failure, so heart failure, renal failure, liver failure, chronic venous insufficiency, which leads to um, an excess of uh, fluid in the tissues, which overloads the lymphatics, obesity, um, trauma or surgery. So if you sprain your ankle, you get swelling, you'd expect that to resolve with, within six to eight weeks. If it's still present at 12 weeks, that is a chronic edema. And infection, we mentioned there's a close link between swelling and cellulitis. And actually what we don't always know is which came first. Was there an underlying problem with the lymphatics, which led to a predisposition to infection? Um, or was there a, an infection which overloaded the lymphatics and then led to a chronic swelling? So the best practice document aims to be a quick and easy guide to help you in managing chronic edema and getting it right first time. And the principles of assessment um, are designed into six S's. And we're going to go through those um, in a little more detail now. So the first S, um, is story. Um, and you're all used to taking a, a history from the patient, uh, past medical history, um, and formulating an assessment. And this is about understanding any factors which can influence the cause of a patient's edema. Thorough history taking helps us to identify risk factors, um, which might be due to immobility, might be due to certain medical conditions um, or lifestyle choices. And also we want to look at an edema history. So when did the swelling start exactly? It's not good enough to think that the swelling's been present for a long time. We want to know how long. Have patients got photographs that show when their swelling was present and when it wasn't? Does it affect the whole of the limb or just part of the limb? Um, does it go down overnight? So taking um, an edema history is really, really important. And that formulates part of our story. The second S is for self-care. So this fits with the trend towards personalized care. 
Um, it's certainly been hugely important um, during the coronavirus pandemic, where we've been requiring patients to um, self-care in a much more active way. And it's crucial where possible that patients are given the opportunity to engage in their care um, to understand um, why this has happened to them and what they can do uh, to learn to live well with it. And the um, NHS long term plan supports um, self care in long term conditions and states that it's a key component to improve efficiency and ensure um, the wise use of our limited resources. But self-care should not be about abandon, abandonment of patients. Self-care should be support it so that patients have an escalation plan if they're struggling or if they have problems and also that they know what to look out for. Self-care is a dynamic and empowering method of long-term management. It's well known in lots of other long-term health conditions like diabetes. But in order to engage, we know that patients need to have a willingness to understand and be health literate, to be central and key to decision making, not have changes forced upon them, and to be central to their care delivery. And as we've said, it's been of primary importance during coronavirus pandemic. The third S is around the site of the swelling. The location of the swelling gives clues to the possible underlying causes and informs us where compression should be applied. And in order to identify where the swelling extends to on the body, it's necessary to examine the full limb. So if patients have chronic edema of the legs, then we do need to examine above the knee, into the thigh, and then onto the body. Does the swelling extend onto the hips, onto the buttocks, onto the abdomen? we can identify other problems. If patients tell us that they've got um, swelling effect in the thighs, which they've never had before, they've also got some associated um, shortness of breath and weight gain, we may be looking towards excluding any heart failure. We might need to undertake an NT Pro BNP blood test, for example. So remembering always that the leg starts at the groin and ends at the toes. It's not just below the knee. The site of the swelling should always mean that we're looking at both legs. So if we're going to see a patient with a wound or a leg ulcer, for example, on one leg, we should always be looking and examining the other leg for any signs of chronic edema or um, underlying chronic venous insufficiency. And we can compare um, the site um, to see whether there is a difference um, in either leg. This can also help us to exclude any acute causes of uh, swelling. So it may be that if one leg is more severely affected, we need to exclude deep vein thrombosis or acute cellulitis. And also it allows us to be more specific to focus our management on those areas. The next S is the skin. So chronic edema can have a very detrimental effect on the skin. Failure of the lymphatics to clear fluid from the tissues can lead to an accumulation of waste products and a lack of nutrients to the area. And with time, you start to get skin and tissue changes. There becomes a thickening um, and a resistance. So uh, swelling can become non-pitting. You can't leave a dent. And often it's vulnerable to damage, breakdown and infection. There are certain skin conditions that can be directly associated and seen commonly in chronic edema. And the following should be noted while assessing the skin. So we should be looking for any pigmentation or hemosiderin staining that could be identified could be telling us or leading us to believe there's some chronic venous insufficiency. We should be looking for any signs of infection. For cellulitis, we're talking about unilateral redness, um, heat, um, and maybe a, an increase in size, but that's a, a poor differential diagnosis. Definitely pain, and the patient may have a temperature um, or general malaise. Leakage of lymph through the skin or lymphorrhea, loss of fluid through the skin or through a wound. Hyperkeratosis, a buildup of brown scaly pigmentation on the surface of the skin, um, which we would need to manage effectively and also any wounds. And of course we then should be carrying out appropriate wound assessment. 
We should also be noting any fungal infections. This can occur in between the toes, in skin folds, um, where the skin resting on skin, um, and also dryness. And it's not always obvious um, for skin to be dry. It doesn't have to be flaking, um, but we need to be careful that we consider um, any sensitivities the patients may have when using topical treatments. We need to be looking at our color sensation and warmth of the skin and the general appearance. So it's anything we can note that we can be looking at to evaluate over time and to see whether that is associated with the swelling or not. The British Lymphology Society launched um, the Red Leg Pathway at its conference in October of this year. The Red Leg Pathway is free to download at the www.thebls.com um, and um, something I'm very proud of came from our hospital locally where I work. And the Red Leg Pathway talks you through the differential diagnosis of unilateral acute cellulitis and bilateral redness, which is really important to be able to focus in on not overusing antibiotics where they're not necessary. So I urge you to download the document and make sure you're familiar with it. The size of the limb is the next important S. So we need to evaluate this at initial assessment to obtain a baseline of measurements. So simple measurements around the ankle, above the bony prominence, around the widest part of the calf um, and around the um, dorsum of the foot can be something that we can use to chart patients' progress over time. Simple measurements above these at these set points can be enough to really help us with demonstrating a response to treatment and also can really spur patients on to continue their own self-management. The size of the limb has an impact on our compression choices and can indicate when we need to employ intensive treatment um, to reduce swelling before we then look at a more longer term or maintenance treatment. An increase in limb size may also indicate the need for a different approach. So in some of these patients, they've needed to undergo multi-layer um, lymphedema bandaging in order to facilitate a reduction, um, improve um, a wound, for example, um, or to reduce lymphorrhea before a longer term approach to compression. It's important when thinking about size to also think about shape, the next S. So we need to think about, will this influence the type of compression that we're going to utilize? So for example, are the toes affected? Does the swelling extend into the top of the foot? Is the patient able to wear um, appropriately fitting footwear? Is there an irregular shape? So with lipodermatosclerosis, we get um, an inverted champagne bottle leg. So the lower part of the leg can be really, really thin and that can lead to um, compression slipping. Does the swelling extend beyond the uh, knees into the thighs? We therefore need to be thinking about taking our compression above the knee. And are there any skin folds present? Poor or irregular shape or the presence of skin folds may need us to pad into those areas to restore the limb shape for graduated compression to be applied. And if the swelling extends into the feet and toes, we may need to look at toe bandaging, if that is a, um, a skill uh, that is uh, available, or uh, toe caps, which can be made to measure um, or off the shelf. So there's plenty of um, choices, and there's no reason why we should not be starting our treatment over the smallest circumference in line with Laplace's law, which is taking into account the toes. We've said about taking the compression above the knee, and actually that may need to be the case in our bandaging technique, as well as for compression hosiery or compression wraps. So if this is something that you're not comfortable with um, or that you need further training on, um, then some of the companies, including ST, provide solutions to this, but also get in touch with your local lymphedema service if you have one. So the principles of chronic edema management fall into an intensive phase, um, which is looking to um, provide generally multi-layer compression bandaging and a maintenance phase or a long-term solution where we're looking more at compression garments, um, which will enable people to be more self-caring. This case study demonstrates um, how we need to uh, look at things differently at times. So this was a 48 year old lady um, with obesity, but no other relevant past medical history, didn't take any medication, who developed three wounds to her inner left thigh. Assessment and Doppler was undertaken by the district nurse in the ambulatory clinic and compression bandaging was indicated. Um, and so she was commenced in full leg, toe to thigh compression bandaging. 
So the National Wound Care Strategy lower limb recommendations state that people with chronic edema um, should uh, be encouraged to elevate, should have multi-layer bandaging if they have abnormal limb shape or size, copious exudate um, or fragile skin. So that was following the guidance and the three wounds at the time measured two by six by three centimeters, 1.4 by two by one centimeter and 0.5 by 1.5 by 0.2. And there were very high exudate levels. The whole leg bandaging was very successful in reducing the edema, but it led to frequent bandage and dressing slippage due to the positioning of the wounds. And thus it was difficult to maintain compression on the affected areas. The patient also wanted to be more self-caring. She was working daily and found it difficult to make time to attend. Um, the weather was extremely hot at the time and she was concerned for her personal hygiene. And her right inner thigh started to become blistered from chafing from the bandaging um, and that was becoming sore. So discussion took place with between the ambulatory clinic uh, and the district nurse and the lymphedema service via secure email. Measurements were taken and provided by the district nurse and a compressive thigh rack was ordered. Once received, this was found to be easy to fit and very comfortable and self-management was enabled for the patient with ongoing support as needed um, by the ambulatory clinic. After three weeks, there was an improvement in the patient's quality of life. She was able to work with greater ease and shower daily. The wound healing was effective with the exudate volume reduced, requiring less absorbent, smaller dressing. So straight away, we're starting to see an appropriate use of resources. After six weeks, the smaller wound healed. The remaining wounds progressed quickly to skin level and measured 0.8 by 3.1 and 0.4 by 0.4. So a really significant um, move for this patient. So the importance of patient choice was noted. This lady preferred to wear um, the wrap next to the skin with just the dressing under, so um, no stockinette or liner, as she stated this was cooler and more comfortable. And due to the excellent knowledge of skills of the district nurse, the patient was fully healed within three months. The patient started in full leg compression, which uh, by textbook is absolutely the right thing to happen. Um, but then reduced to thigh length, uh, compression to thigh on the, com sorry, compression on the thigh only, which would not be considered best practice generally. But the reasons were that the priority was wound healing um, and the heat and the patient needing to um, self-care at the time. She knew she was going to be required to undergo lifelong compression once the wounds had healed and that this would generally be full leg in approach and she was observed for any increase in edema below the knee. So she then progressed to her chronic edema management under the care of the lymphedema service as she no longer had a wound, didn't need the ambulatory care clinic anymore. And despite the restrictions um, that COVID has placed on us, this shows that effective joint working and communication could still be achieved um, and led to a very positive patient outcome um, and experience. So compression um, therapy works um, by enhancing the muscle pumping um, and also providing a counterforce to limit the collection of fluid within a limb. It increases venous and lymphatic return um, and generally uh, by being graduated follows um, Laplace's law. So it enables us to make sure um, uh, and is generally accepted that we can provide compression in a variety of different ways. We've mentioned bandaging, um, wraps and compression hosiery. Um, and so there are many different approaches that we can use. Before the application of compression, um, ABPI or Doppler um, is generally carried out. In chronic edema management, this can be extremely problematic um, due to the size of the limb, the shape of the, the limb. It may be due to the position of the wound or lymphorrhea. But the British Lymphology Society has produced a, a position paper for the application of compression in the absence of ABPI. Again, it's another document I urge you to download. It's underpinning the National Wound Care Strategy uh, lower limb recommendations and uh, my Legs Matter colleagues are raising awareness of the importance of the application of compression in the absence of red flags. And this document helps to carry out vascular assessment with an assessment tool and there's a standardized, standardized template letter um, which um, explains why an ABPI has not been carried out and why the patient has been commenced in compression. So um, things are changing, do have the courage um, to compress and move patients forward. We are looking in our selection of compression 
to think about whether we need to carry out that intensive phase of bandaging first to reduce the edema, to uh, promote a more normal uh, shape and size where possible, to improve venous and lymphatic return and heal any uh, wounds, improve the skin condition. So good com compression will reduce and eliminate hyperkeratosis in time. And also we know that um, when we provide multilayer lymphedema bandaging, there are other options with compressive wraps. So it's all about individualized care. After decongestion or after intensive um, management of chronic edema, we can achieve wound healing, reduction in size and shape, which you can see here. We should always uh, aim after that reduction phase and once a wound has been healed to continue our compression therapy lifelong, to maintain the size and shape, to prevent any recurrence of wounds, to continue to support the venous and lymphatic system and to increase the muscle pumping of the calf. We know that there are a, a plethora of confusing um, classifications for um, measurement of compression, and therefore we prefer to use the millimeters of mercury um, rather than the classes, which seems to be less confusing. And the National Wound Care Strategy would advocate that 14 to 17 millimeters of mercury can be applied without ABPI in the absence of red flags. So we need to be encouraging more people into lower strength compression straight away. An inelastic garment um, or flat knit garment or one with a higher static stiffness is similar to a paper cup in that as you fill it with water, it retains its shape and more stubborn swelling can be contained. It prevents the rebound of fluid or the recurrence of fluid and it reduces the effect of a tourniquet um, that a more elastic garment can provide. So the more elastic garment here, um, which is like a water balloon, the more fluid you fill it with, the more it expands. And the resultant effect is the garment may not be able to contain that fluid. And depending on the severity, the limb may continue to swell and the leg may potentially break down due to that tourniquet effect or a lack of compression where needed. When measuring for compression, it's really important that we take into account um, whether that's going to be a below knee garment or a thigh length garment, whether it's going to be tights if both legs are affected, for example, or whether it might be in the form of leggings um, or capri pants. There's a great deal of help out there for measuring, but it's important that we use um, each different hosiery company's measurement instructions to ensure that we get the right garment. If it's off the shelf, there tend to be less measurements to record, whereas if it's made to measure, there can be more significant uh, measuring process. And I urge you to become more familiar um, with the guides from the companies to make sure that you get the garment right. So what can you do for chronic edema? And um, the best practice statement takes you through those six S's, and then we need to be revising to make sure that we've done everything. Pharmacological management of chronic edema um, is very poor. They're, they're not um, a, a plethora of drugs which help with chronic edema. Generally, as we've said, it doesn't respond to diuretic therapy. However, there are drugs that can cause or exacerbate chronic edema, um, and that tends to be the calcium channel blockers um, and some Parkinson's medication. So calcium channel blockers, things like amylodipine, nifedipine, um, but also gabapentin and pregabalin. So these can also cause some redness in the legs as well. We need to be making sure that patients have got adequate pain relief and antihistamines. Skin itching is a significant problem, particularly in elderly patients where there may be urticaria as well. We need to be looking to provide um, patients with um, adequate uh, relief from these very debilitating symptoms. Skin care, ensuring that any areas of chronic edema are washed daily, dried thoroughly and moisturized with a bland emollient. There may need to be some debriding. There may need to be some specific wound management. If there is redness on uh, the skin, so if we have red leg syndrome, it may be necessary to introduce uh, a steroid, topical steroid, and observing the skin daily for any changes is of paramount importance. We've said that compression choices may be in the form of bandaging, wraps, um, or compression hosiery, um, and that this needs to be individualized for each patient. There is no one approach and no one um, garment is right for all patients. 
This should always take into account the full extent of the swelling as well. So taking into account those tricky areas um, like the toes. Exercise, we need to be much more proactive in encouraging our patients to exercise. Um, there's loads of information out there, um, including the Legs Matter Live Lounge resources, um, which are available on the Legs Matter website. And these take you through how to exercise um, in sitting, which can be really important um, for those patients with poor mobility. We need to make sure that patients um, are walking more where they're able to and using their appropriate aids. Healthy eating, sorry, positioning um, is the flip side of exercising. So we need to be making sure that patients' limbs are not dependent for long periods, that they're going to bed at night. That might need um, that we secure a hospital bed. We need to be using footstools and pillows to elevate the legs, heel sparing, of course, um, but needs to be thought about to promote comfort as well. Many patients find that elevating their legs can cause stiffness around the knees um, and hips. And then when they stand to walk, they can become unstable. So we need to be um, individualized our positioning care as well as our hosiery choices and skincare. Healthy eating, we know that obesity causes um, chronic edema, so we need to be maintaining a healthy body weight where possible. Dieting if necessary, involving our dietetic colleagues and referral to bariatric services um, in obesity where patients are in agreement um, can have some really um, massive life altering changes for some people. We need to be ensuring that we refer on to our colleagues in dermatology if we suspect skin allergies um, or any dermatitis, maybe patch testing will be needed or any suspected skin cancers. We need to be referring to vascular services for patients who've got non-healing wounds. Um, we need to be referring patients who've got symptomatic varicose veins. We know that venous uh, surgical venous intervention um, can be really effective and also can now be appropriate for so many more patients um, as it's uh, daily um, daycare rather than needing patients to stay overnight. And we need to be referring patients to lymphedema services where at all possible, especially if that swelling um, is within the upper limbs or to the trunk as well. So remember, good chronic edema management uh, in a timely fashion can reduce hospital admissions and the incidence of cellulitis, as well as ensuring effective and appropriate use um, of limited resources. Um, so I hope that this document will be really useful and something that you'll find will enhance your um, patient care. SAT, who've kindly sponsored this session today, have um, 31 modules available to increase your knowledge and skills um, all around um, anatomy and physiology um, and uh, management of leg ulcers and chronic edema. And they also have developed a number of support tools um, to support you and your patients. And they, and they have an excellent um, patient uh, forum called Lymph Connect. So if you're not aware of that, make sure that you uh, find out about it because chronic edema patients can be supported through this online forum, which has been particularly important again during the coronavirus pandemic. And just to make you aware of um, the Legs Matter endorsed British Lymphology Society um, campaign, um, which is everybody can. So this is about saying that everybody um, can do something to increase their exercise and activity, which we know has so many um, positive benefits, um, including that impact on our venous and lymphatic return, but also on our mental well-being um, and on our whole body, our whole cardiovascular system to keep us well. So we need to be um, much more proactive, as I said, in encouraging people um, to maximize their potential um, as far as their exercise. So um, this campaign will be running um, for um, the majority of 2021. Um, so please make sure you visit the website to download your free resources. And um, Lymphedema Awareness Week, which is in March of each year, um, will have a real focus on activity and exercise for next year. So see if you can plan your activities ahead of the game. So thank you very much. I look forward to receiving your questions um, and I hope that it will be a useful document that you will um, engage with. Thank you, Becky. <laughs> it was a, uh, a, a very good presentation. I could, uh, I could listen to you all night. Um, so we've had tons of questions and I'm going to get straight to them given the time. Uh, question number one is, would red legs be classed as a skin condition and how do you manage it? 
yes, I suppose it is a skin condition um, in many ways because we see the redness on the surface of the skin, but that erythema is present. There can be redness associated with warmth and heat as well and pain and discomfort. The most common cause of red legs is lipodermatosclerosis. So um, a condition we associate with chronic venous insufficiency where we get that inverted champagne bottle um, shape that we talked about. And so um, the management of red legs primarily focuses on good skincare. So skin hygiene, um, drying thoroughly, moisturizing with a bland emollient, then waiting 30 minutes before applying a topical steroid a potent steroid to start with, reducing um, to a, a lesser strength in time. Often um, an antimicrobial layer or a silk garment um, has shown to have really good effect. I know that there is a tendency towards not prescribing these now. We've had to write lots of justification because they've certainly made a difference to a lot of patients, particularly elderly patients. And then um, the main key to improving red leg syndrome is compression. So um, we are looking to provide usually low strength off the shelf garments um, to encourage the um, fluid uh, to have a good venous and lymphatic return, as we've said. And if you uh, tick all those boxes, as well as getting patients to be as active as possible within their limits, generally red leg syndrome is well managed and patients live, uh, live well with it. Brilliant. I think that was a, a very comprehensive answer. So uh, whoever asked that question, hopefully um, got what they needed. Um, question number two from Ina Farrelly. Are you looking at the impact of the patient's biomechanics or alignment and its impact on muscle function relationship with edema? And then thinking of those lovely bulging, it says knee above knee highs. Does that Hi. Um, hi there. Um, I think it's really interesting because um, Ina is a podiatrist. We've been trying to increase our awareness um, of podiatry related issues and biomechanics. So the British Lymphology Society this year had a half um, day session with the College of Podiatry because we know that we've not been good um, at looking at the overlap um, between our um, professions and that for our patients, that's not the best thing. So we do need to be working in association with our podiatry colleagues and and orthotics departments to make sure that we focus on um, the biomechanics and altered gait that many of our patients with edema have, um, particularly when we're talking about that um, large swelling that's um, forced into the knee and around the knee with below knee only treatments. Um, so um, we need lots more of Ina. She's a specialist lymphedema podiatrist who I believe is heading heading off out of the UK for her retirement. Um, so we, we're going to miss you and we need lots more of you. Well, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess so. And Ina can continue, obviously, to uh, to contribute to these events uh, from wherever she is in, in, in her happy retirement, I'm sure. Um, question number three is from Vanessa Hewitson Townley. And this is, what are the red flags that would stop you using compression, please? So I think that it's really important that um, each individual patient is assessed for red flags, but there's not a significant um, set of red flags that, that you should you should look at. So the lower limb recommendations of the National Wound Care Strategy is what you need to look at for those initial red flags. So that's things like acute infection, acute deep vein thrombosis, um, and um, any uh, non-diagnosed heart failure. Um, so I think that those are the obvious red flags we look for, but obviously we should also be looking individually at each patient um, and following the British Lymphology Society vascular assessment, which takes you through the process, the supported process to identify those red flags prior to the application of compression in the absence of ABPI. Okay, thank you. Um, question number four, what are your thoughts around cellulitis and antibiotic resistance? And how should we be trying to address that? I think that acute cellulitis needs management with antibiotics. That is the, the, the treatment. Um, and therefore, um, we would be um, encouraging um, our um, health professionals to be working with microbiology and the antimicrobial stewards to make sure that we were um, appropriately utilizing antibiotics. But the treatment of choice for acute cellulitis is antibiotics. 
In red leg syndrome, that's where we've had the overuse of antibiotics, the provision of antibiotics just in case of infection, when the patient is systemically well, has got bilateral redness, which is not spreading, um, and is caused by a another cause. As we've said, lipodermatous sclerosis being the most common, but also dermatitis, varicose eczema, there are other, other conditions. So that's where the overuse of antibiotics has come into play. And we know that um, cellulitis is overdiagnosed in patients with bilateral redness. So the red leg pathway is designed to help that differential diagnosis and make sure that antibiotics are used effectively. Excellent, thank you. Um, question number five is from Deb Taylor and says, what is the best management for leaking toes? Wow, that's a hard one because um, leaking toes is a really, really difficult thing to manage. I think the most important thing is daily washing to remove the lymph, which can be acidic. So making sure that we are um, bathing the area um, and then um, drying it thoroughly. So it might be that we need to use gauze to, to dry in between the areas um, or tissue. Then an application of a, a bland emollient. So not forgetting our skincare in those areas. And then often... Um, we utilize pleating, um, so folding, like you used to make a fan when you were at school, and um, folding backwards and forwards with some of the super absorbent dressings. It needs to be the super absorbent dressings that are thin and both sides are absorbent. So you can then pleat in between the toes. That applies compression because the pleat is trying to expand, but it also means that there is something in between the toes and then toe bandaging over that. So again, toe bandaging, I'm aware, is not a skill that everybody um, utilizes regularly or feels competent with. So again, liaising with um, your lymphedema service to, to, to give you support with that, or you can use um, toe hosiery. So in the form of a made to measure um, toe cap um, or a, um, an off the shelf toe cap, um, if that will fit. Um, and again, these need to be plentiful so that you can wash them regularly and, and get them dry um, so that patients can have fresh, dry garments. But bandaging would be uh, the better option um, for that uh, toe leakage. It sounds, um, yeah, it sounds difficult to manage. I think um, as soon as you, uh, as soon as we finish here, um, you need to get onto the uh, patent office and patent a, uh, a patent your concertina dressing for toes. I think I quite like the idea of that one. <laughs> um, question number uh, question number six from Michelle Margaret is: Should all patients have a Doppler scan before any compression therapy, whether it be bandaging slash hosiery? No, this is this is the important message we're trying to get across. Um, is that actually we understand that um, that a Doppler or an ABPI is not possible in lots of patients. So in lymphedema management, we've known for many, many years that it's not possible to undertake an ABPI or a Doppler on a lot of our patients because their limbs are either too large or the shape's too poor um, or they've got excessive lymphorrhea. Um, so no, we know that we can safely apply compression in the absence of an ABPI um, or Doppler um, as long as we carry out um, a vascular assessment in the absence of red flags. So again, that British Lymphology Society um, position document takes you through, it has a vascular assessment tool that you can build up your confidence with knowing that you're still doing a vascular assessment, you're still thinking about those red flags, um, but then you're moving forward to apply compression in a really timely um, and effective manner. Yeah, and it, it's it's actually something that we've addressed in, uh, in, in, other, um, in other presentations over the last, uh, over the last, 12 months, I guess. I've heard it said quite a few times. In fact, we had an event last week with um, some uh, people from Legs Matter who said exactly that, exactly the same thing as what you've just said. Um, question number seven. This is our, our final question. Uh, and this is from Michelle Margaret. Uh, when it's pitting edema, what does this indicate? So pitting edema shows that there's a higher water content to the swelling. So we often think about pitting edema um, as being something that we would see in patients with dependency swelling. So swelling that's related to immobility or, for example, um, excess fluid due to uh, patients with end stage uh, system failure, like heart failure. So pitting is when you can leave a dent in the skin. So um, sometimes we think about when patients mark severely from um, 
clothing or from the side of a wheelchair or or anything that they're pressed against so this pitting is whether you can leave a dent or not so it generally tends to be the, those swellings that are a higher water content in true lymphedema um, we've said there tends to be those skin and tissue changes which make it more resistant um, and harder to, to, to leave a dent or to pit. So generally it's the higher watery swellings that are pitting. Excellent. Um, well, that is our final uh, live question tonight, Becky. Um, thank you very much for joining us, everybody. And I'd like to uh, have another shout out to Essity for supporting um, us this year and supporting um, the education that we provide, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, on a weekly basis. So thank you very much. Uh, if we didn't get around to answering your question this evening, then as with our other events, we'll be downloading all of the comments tomorrow. We'll be sharing those and getting uh, written answers to them. And then we put a document up onto our website along with a copy of this presentation um, and a copy of the video. So you'll be able to go and check whether we've actually responded to, uh, to your question. There should be some email addresses, a concierge at SET. I, I don't know the exact email address. You have to apologize. I, I do apologize. But um, if one of my colleagues can just pop that up on the screen, there's an email address there. So um, Becky mentioned quite a lot of... Uh, um, concierge.service at SET.com. There you go. That's the one. Um, but the, if you contact those, if you've got any queries about any of the products mentioned, if you've got any queries about getting a copy of the document, or if you want to um, get access to their um, to their academy, then do go and take a look. It's a fantastic website. And also, um, one of the other things that Becky mentioned was uh, the uh, the Lymph Connect uh, platform, and I think that's a really, really interesting and uh, and decent platform. So do go and check that out. Um, thank you very much for joining us, each and every one of you. There, there will also be links on your screen to download your certificates. Um, we really appreciate the amount of effort that uh, uh, the, the amount of um, effort that people put into actually furthering their own education. We can see from the comments that this evening's session has uh, has gone down really, really well. We'll be back tomorrow for the final JCN live for the year. Um, please do join us. That one is at uh, seven o'clock. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to, because I'm not back tomorrow, so I'll take this opportunity to wish you all a fantastic Christmas and a happy new year. Um, please enjoy yourselves, stay safe. Hopefully COVID will be gone before, uh, before we come back in the new year. Um, yeah, fingers crossed. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, we look forward to catching up with you again soon.